Okay, it is time for the second half of chapter 35. We begin by shifting our attention from Europe and its struggles with communism versus capitalism to Asia. Asia itself had also been seeing some massive changes after Japan was defeated. They fully cooperate with America to rebuild their country. It's a big reason why we have such a good relationship with them is because we were able to basically create a government and a situation where we would be very aligned in our uh, the way our societies function. And even though there are a lot of cultural differences, we are able to be quite friendly because of those uh, changes to Japan's uh, government and society. Um, so with our support, the economy in Japan also blossoms. And by the 1960s and 70s, they actually begin competing with us for uh, economic manufacturing uh, uh, pr primacy. So, uh, so China at the same time was mired in a civil war as uh, the World War II came to an end. The United States backed a democratic nationalist regime, or at least a non-communist regime, but a leader known as Mao Zedong in, uh, leads uh, a successful Chinese revolution in 1949. Now, after America had thrown a lot of money and support behind that nationalist regime, resisting Mao Zedong, this is going to lead to some, uh, well, fears in America that we can't stop the spread of communism. Combined with a successful Soviet atom bomb test, Truman felt immense pressure without and within. So you can see why after a massive nation turns communist, why suddenly we feel like we need to start developing bigger weapons like the hydrogen bomb. And also why we have to continue to use our power to stop the spread of communism everywhere, not just in Europe. Which brings us to the Korean War. Uh, like Germany, Korea had been divided by the Soviet Union and the United States. Uh, and so at, at the 49th parallel, uh, the northern section was defended and controlled by the uh, Soviet Union and the south by the U.S. After both withdrew their soldiers, the communists in the north decided to attack the southern portion of Korea. Now, this was because uh, Stalin gave them his uh, permission, I guess you could say. Because he didn't think America cared about Korea. Uh, after all, this is in the Asian region, which we had not had traditionally much uh, interaction. However, we decided that we wanted to use our containment doctrine. Truman viewed this as a test of his Truman doctrine, and so we throw everything at winning this war. NSC 68 recommends the U.S. quadruple their defense spending. So we begin spending billions of dollars every year. 3.5 million Americans are recruited to fight in this war. The Soviets were also absent at the United Nations meeting where the U.S. got the Security Council to denounce North Korean aggression. Had the Soviets been there, they probably would have said no to that and vetoed it. But with that said, the United Nations then lends their support, giving about 12% of the forces and also some financial support to the war. And this is basically how the war unfolds. You can see on the left side, June 25th, 1950, North Korea decides to invade. And by September, they had trapped the uh, uh, southern Korean forces in that small little region around Busan. And uh, you can see America in 1950 leads a massive counterattack, uh, landing in the middle of the country surrounding North Korean forces who are forced to surrender. And that's where an issue comes about because we come a little too close to the Chinese border. And when we push too close to the Chinese border, they warn that if you keep pushing closer, we will attack. And sure enough, they do. But the general that we had was General MacArthur, the same man who, who was the leader during the Bonus Army March who ushered them out of the city violently uh, in uh, Hoover's presidency. And so MacArthur, when he sees the Chinese flooding over the border and pushing Americans back, he actually publicly calls for a nuclear attack. When Truman says, we can't do that, that's too brutal to, to use nuclear warfare for a, a war that is not for our survival and for the betterment of humanity as a whole, uh, MacArthur decides to publicly challenge him, which leads to MacArthur actually getting fired. Later on, MacArthur will try to run for president uh, and accuse Truman of being a communist sympathizer. And so we could see some divisions over how this war was handled. Now, during Eisenhower, the next president's uh, term, he will settle the peace to uh, create that border you see uh, on, on the picture to the right, where they will just allow North Korea and South Korea to exist with a ceasefire. And that ceasefire lasted all the way until actually Donald Trump's presidency. 
So the Cold War home front. So how is the Cold War affecting Americans? It had a massive influence on every facet of our life, in society, politics, and even economics. Everyone and everything in America was affected by our fear of communism and by our nation's actions to try to get rid of communism. So first we have uh, Congress deciding to investigate what they called subversion. We using the House Un-American Activities Committee, also called HUAC, how creative, uh, they investigate people they think are undermining our government and involved in espionage or trying to lead us towards communism. So one man, Alger Hiss, who works for the government, is, is investigated, is actually prosecuted by Richard Nixon in Congress. He is found guilty and put in prison. So Nixon begins his his uh, popular career in American politics as a communist witch hunter. Now, I say witch hunt. That's more of a term we use in the next slide. But the idea was uh, we need to chase down anyone who is suspected of being communist. And there were a lot of people that were, in fact, communist and undermining our government or handing over important plans, such as the handing over of the Soviet atomic data. The Rosenbergs, a couple that worked for the American government and in the missile program, uh, end up being found guilty of espionage and are actually executed uh, because of it. Um, the only people in peacetime to be executed for espionage. So when they are executed, they're not the only ones who are uh, found guilty of being communist sympathizers. Eleven are also sent to prison for plotting to overthrow the government. This fear of communism and the idea that we have informants and spies everywhere leads us on, as I said a minute ago, a witch hunt, which brings us to... McCarthy's reign of terror. Joseph McCarthy was a senator, and in his campaign, he said that he had a list of hundreds of communists that should he be elected, he would hunt down and make sure that were they were taking out of uh, their positions. As his crusade gathered attention, he used his pulpit to ruin the lives of innocent lawyers, officials, actors, and writers. Uh, by 1954, he even begins attacking the U.S. Army, claiming that there's people in the military that are also undermining our government. Congress will end up censuring him, mostly because he was on television, and we realized that he was really just hunting down people for his own, uh, I guess you could say, fame, and to get more power and attention. And so with that in mind, they censure him because he was clearly uh, not using any evidence, rather just using his position to bully people, harass them, etc. So McCarthy and other Red Hunters, Red meaning communism again, and other Red Hunters revealed developing U.S. sentiment of fighting a war of good versus evil. Communism was evil. Everything that was different from the American dream and values and tradition was evil. So the U.S. leans into our past by becoming more religious. We add under God to the pledge. We add a uh, 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 different uh, God in different aspects of our society. The atheistic communism, because communism basically says there can be no religion. The state is the religion. Uh, communism is viewed as the ultimate evil. And so uh, this causes Americans to lean back into our tradition and be quite um, what's the word? Uh, conformed to what tradition would tell them how they were supposed to be acting. Truman does segregate, desegregate the armed forces in the Korean War, which is pretty cool. Completely unrelated, I would say, to this slide. I don't know why that's necessarily there, uh, but that is the first big step. So if you're looking for steps for African Americans during this Cold War, despite all these other challenges happening, that is one positive thing that we did. Post-war economic anxieties, the U.S. economy sacked from 1945 to 1947. Uh, anytime you have soldiers returning from war, even if eventually our economy is going to boom, as it will, uh, when, uh, when soldiers return for war and we're not exactly sure what they're going to do, there is a lag for the um, for the economy. That happens after World War I as well, and that was followed by the 1920s, and this as well will be followed by the boom of the 1950s and 60s. Tatch Hartley undid much of the New Deal victories for labor, so sadly we begin shutting down a lot of the things that uh, Americans had gained in the workplace under things like the Wagner Act and the Fair Labor Standards Act. It says no closed shops where everybody has to be in a union, uh, no liability, and loyalty oaths. Loyalty oaths related to communism say that you have to promise that you are loyal to the American government and to capitalism. Uh, if you refuse to give it, then you would be blacklisted. Teachers especially were forced to take these oaths because we were in charge of teaching our children. Uh, and so if you would not give those oaths, then you could be fired and unable to find a job. Uh, the CIO, uh, the uh, uh, 
non-skilled labor part of the American Federation of Labor tried to organize the South in Operation Dixie, but failed because, again, people began viewing uh, them as both communists, uh, they began viewing unions as big government, and also there was a fear of forcing racial integration. And in the South, they're just not ready for that in that post-war era. Finally, this brings us to the GI Bill. And out of this entire slide, I'd say this is what's most important. That's because the GI Bill boosts the U.S. economy. Basically, because soldiers come home and don't have anything to do, we have to find a way to help them transition into life as citizens uh, while allowing others to keep their jobs. So that the GI Bill pays for uh, veterans to go, to go to college, uh, pays for home loans so they could purchase homes and also allows them to open businesses by giving them business loans. This helps uh, them settle into American society while the others who had taken their uh, jobs during the war get to keep them and keep working. So this enables us to have nearly everyone working. This also creates a new wave of college graduates and so we become a much higher educated country than we had been before the war. This brings us to a little bit more of the politic, political side. Truman does win in 1948. Republicans had wanted to end Democratic control of the White House, which they'd had throughout all of FDR. And now we're going to have four more years with Truman through 1952. Truman does barely win, but he, when he wins, he doesn't really get much. And that's because Americans were looking for a much more conservative government. After FDR and the war, what people wanted to do is get back to just regular life and not having government involved in it. And so Truman... Uh, is in a bad situation or a tough situation because he wants to throw out his fair deal. He wants to keep building on uh, FDR's new deal by improving housing, uh, pushing for full employment, have national health insurance for all Americans, extending Social Security. And these are things that you would see happening in European nations throughout the next several decades. And it made sense because most developed nations were pursuing it. However, Americans uh, pushed back against it because Congress is divided over these issues, uh, and you have a lot of Republicans saying that they don't want to continue the Democratic push for these things. So this brings us back to the economy. So we've gone over politics and a little bit of society, but what about ec economics? 1950, after we get at, through the short post-war period, um, it ushers in two decades of explosive growth. Sometimes you hear it called the affluent era because uh, we made more money than ever before in this time period. Sadly, this money doesn't reach everyone. You have Native Americans. You have some African Americans in the South. You have many people uh, – who struggle, but most U.S. lives were impacted by this. Prosperity also creates social mobility, allowing for people to climb into higher levels of society. If you started a lower working class individual, you could end your life in, in the upper middle class, and that's because of this affluence and money that was being pumped into our economy. Funding for new welfare programs was also pushed as we'll cover in Nixon's presidency, civil rights movement, uh, you have the global leadership. Um, so all of this prosperity brings some massive changes to not only our society, uh, but also to how we uh, interact with the world. Unlike the 1920s, majority of Americans own the products and homes they bought. So we're not just buying things on credit, meaning this is an actual true boom time. Remember, everything had been bought on credit in the 1920s, and, and that helped lead to the crash of our economy at the end of the decade. So, but so the growth in the 1950s and 60s will, uh, sh will actually be legitimate growth that was sustainable. Women do benefit the most, filling in many jobs. More women go to uh, college than ever before in the next several decades. This will lead to the second wave feminism. So economic growth not only leads to the civil rights movement, it also leads to women pushing for their rights. A society continued to glorify the tra traditional homemaker role. So even though women do get all these new jobs and all these new opportunities, in the 1950s especially, uh, we continue to push what we call the cult of domesticity. That's the idea that women belong in the home uh, and taking care of the family. Um, so we'll see some challenges to that in the next couple decades, but understand that in the 1950s, because there was this fear of communism, of course, we accepted that we believed women uh, needed to have that traditional role and people who pushed against the tr traditional role were more likely to be radicals. So what caused the post-war prosperity? What caused all these things? Well, we have no competitors. They are all ravaged by the war. Uh, military spending and involvement around the world, the Korean War, and, and, and continue to be involved in uh, revolutions and other things around the world for the next several decades helps create jobs. And then you have cheap energy. We have access to really easy, easily affordable oil. We also have increased productivity and in education. 
uh, we have more jobs available, more people working, and more people getting higher education. And then you have farms taken over by corporations, pushing for more industrial work. So if we all can be fed because these corporations are taking care of those things for us. Americans were incredibly mobile in the post-war years. We see a massive amount of migration across our country. And the main area that they moved, as I've said in class already, is to the South. Uh, we had war jobs uh, and war factories being built across the South. And this area that became known as the Sun Belt, stretching from Southern California through New, Me New Mexico and Arizona into Texas, and even into those some Southern states that would have been the Deep South. Uh, we see massive growth in those areas, people looking for better jobs, better climates, escaping what we call the Rust Belt in the north, which was cold, and their factories were old, and there were less jobs available. And finally, also lower taxes in most of those states in the south. Uh, military jobs also are often found in the south as well. And so you have all these jobs being created across our country and causing people to move around. Uh, the Rust Belt, the areas around, say, Michigan, Wisconsin, Ohio, and the Northeast, like in New England, are hit hard by population loss, causing some economic struggles. And North also loses control of political life because of the population moving from those dense urban areas into the urban areas around the rest of the country. So, uh, again, uh, lots of reasons for that post-war prosperity, and migration causes a lot of massive changes as well. And some of those, uh, uh, those population movements were just outside of those urban areas, creating what we call the suburbs or a suburban region. So the government helps these things by building th uh, the interstate highways to allow people to commute into the city, provide tax credits for people who are purchasing homes, and also FHA or first home buyer loans and veteran loans help people purchase houses. Uh, Levittown is your very first what we would call suburb or suburbia, really. Uh, when you look at Spring Hill and you think of all of the the amount of houses that have been built in on streets, winding streets, Levittown was the first to do that. And they are mass-produced cookie-cutter houses, sped up construction massively. One crew puts the foundation down, the next puts the frame down, the next uh, does the brick on the outside, etc. And so by basically creating mass production for housing, this helps lower the cost and allows people to move out of the cities. The problem is, you can see there is, quote, white flight. Uh, these suburbs, uh, these suburban areas often left uh, urban centers with all all of the minorities. In fact, Levittown did not allow anyone but white citizens to live in their housing district, and they're not the only place, a uh, place outside Chicago, a place outside Detroit. Many of these suburbs did the same exact thing, and this pulled all the tax support and businesses outside of those urban areas as well, and so our inner cities are left with people with very little money struggling to make it, and they don't have the tax revenue to help improve their cities. And so there are some serious issues there. As you can see, minorities also were not be were considered a risk to uh, give loans to. They also just didn't, as the developers believed, fit in the, quote, neighborhood composition. So clearly there are some issues here which are limiting uh, black social mobility and other minority groups and feeds into a wealth gap between the races. And that brings us to the final part of the post-war, and that is that we have a massive baby boom. 50 million babies were born from the end of the war to the end of the 1950s. Uh, so uh, my parents are born in 1954, so they're part of the post-war baby boom. So what this does is create some massive changes in our society over the next several decades. So first, why does the baby boom happen? Well, affluence. We have money, so people are comfortable in creating families and large families at that. After all, uh, like I said, my mom was... Uh, I was born in 1954, and she had six siblings. So uh, after the post-war baby boom, you then have to build more schools to house these kids. But what happens after those kids leave? Well, in the 1980s, we have a shortage of students, and so teaching, teaching and education sees a massive drop-off in funding and in jobs because of that. Uh, currently, how did it impact society in the last 10, 15 years? Well, when you look at politics, politics radically shifted to meet the demands of those older, that older population. And it's probably one big reason why Donald Trump wins, because a lot of these older uh, uh, folks are more likely to be conservative because of the time period they grew up in. And so you can see not only uh, issues with politics, as I just mentioned, but you also have issues in the economy. Uh, why do you think I have adult diaper videos uh, are, are, uh, on uh, different game shows or different – uh, 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 TV channels. It's because they are trying, they know how many people are watching 
from that massive population boom that are still alive today. And then one final thing is why is Social Security strained so badly? And that's because we have so many people who are living longer. And with this massive population boom from the baby boom all the way back in the 1950s and 60s, they are now putting a strain because there are so many people in that population group uh, on our uh, economy and our social services. So a lot of information there at the end, and I bet you weren't expecting an adult diaper reference. But uh, it is undoubtedly an, uh, influenced by this baby boom. This is the end to chapter 35. Hopefully you learned a lot. And uh, yeah, have a wonderful day.